Have you ever had anybody pay it all for you? Maybe you're at a restaurant and the check came and instead of the typical guy thing with the alligator arms, you someone actually grabbed a check and said, I've, I'll pay, I got it all, I got it all. That's a good feeling, right? <laughs> when, when Sandy and I moved here in 1991, um, I was promoted to a position in VP of sales for one of the carpet mills. And shortly after we got here, our nine-year-old daughter um, had an MMR shot. And she was one of the few individuals who, instead of, uh, instead of being able to fight off those viruses, her body took them on. And if you've ever been involved with someone who has an immune deficiency or an autoimmune problem, it gets crazy and it gets nasty. And it goes on and on and on and on. So she was in Scottish Rite from a week to a month to months. They were doing tests and scans. And meanwhile, I'm in this new position and the bills are mounting. And I showed up one Monday morning and the head of HR said, hey, come down to my office. So I did and he said, Ron, we know you're under a lot of pressure. We want you to know we're taking care of the debt. We're going to cover, it was tens of tens of thousands of dollars. And, you know, so I said, <laughs> he said, Don, our president wants to see you. So I, you know, wiped the crazy mist out of my eyes. <laughs> and I went up to his office and I sat down and he said, Ron, you're valuable to us. We need you in the conference room. We need you strategizing. We need you in front of our sales force. We need you to be the face to our customers. And carrying this debt, <laughs> it's, not, it's heavy on you. We wanna take care of that. And not only taking care of this debt, we're taking care of any more debt that comes. You're valuable to us. <laughs> Guys, do you know how valuable you are to God? He's paid your debt. He doesn't want you carrying weight. He needs you. <laughs> in the conference room. He needs you strategizing. He needs you with your family, planning. He needs your smiling face with your kids and your grandkids and your neighbors and wherever you're planted. That's why he's paid it all. And you know, we were talking at our table, this gets diminished, right? It gets dulled down. I can tell you from experience, it happened in my life. It happened three decades in a conference room. That didn't enter in very much sometimes, a lot of time. It happens, you know, when you've been married for almost five decades. Sandy and I are very social, go to a lot of parties. This isn't talked about. It gets dulled down. What we're celebrating today gets too dulled down. Today we're going to magnify it, Come on. <laughs> right? <laughs> so what took place on that cross? Jesus had a crown of thorns pressed into his head. His face, Isaiah tells us, was unrecognizable. It was beat, it was bloodied, it was swollen. His back, the skin was ripped off of it, scourged. His hands were nailed, his feet were nailed. The dirt at the bottom of the cross likely was a mud pile of his blood dripping down. So let's go to the final moments. Go ahead and take out your bifold. Let's look at the final moments of Jesus' life. You know, the soldiers were doing their job, right? The Roman soldiers. Can you imagine that job? They had to be callous. Put this Jewish dog on the cross. Let's gamble for his clothes. Pilate says, put a sign above his head. King of the Jews. Here comes the religious leaders. Not how. Oh, change that. Say, he said, he's the king of the Jews. They just push him back. We have our orders. Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The ladies come forward. Jesus says, John. Behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. Cross, the, the two thieves are arguing back and forth. One of them says, Jesus, take me into your kingdom. Jesus says, today, you'll be with me in your kingdom. Now we're at the final moments of his life. Let's read it. I'm going to 
I pull from each of the Gospels. We have an eyewitness in Matthew. We have an eyewitness in John. We have Luke, who interviewed all kinds of people to find out what exactly happened. What did you see? Were you there? He records it. You have Mark, who was the pen. He had the pen for Peter, right? He wrote for Peter, another eyewitness. Let's look, Matthew 27, 46. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma, sap- lemma sakpathani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Jesus is quoting David here. <laughs> we do not have enough time this morning. Read Psalm 22. If you want to know what Jesus felt on the cross, read Psalm 22. It's prophetic. David helps us realize it. Thank you, brother. Um, Go to, let's go to the next one down, John 19. After this, knowing that everything had been accomplished and to to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine and vinegar was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. You know what that probably was? The Roman soldiers were given a field kit. In the field kit, if it became time to what a lot of us did during break time, run to the restroom, <laughs> The soldiers would go off to the side, do what they had to do. They take a sponge, they take the stick, they dip it in vinegar, and they clean themselves. So it was there for the soldiers. Jesus says, I'm thirsty. And the Roman soldiers go, fine. And that's what they put in Jesus' mouth. And with that taste in his mouth, Jesus says, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, to tell us die. It's finished. To tell us die. What is that? It's interesting. Jesus used an accounting word. It means paid in full. It's what we just sang. To tell us die. It's paid in full. It's finished. Everything is paid in full. And look what happened after he said that word. And at that moment, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. The earth quaked, the rocks were split. Then Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said it, he breathed his last. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that, in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this was the Son of God. Jesus said to tell us die, it's finished, it's paid in full. The earth starts shaking. Do you know what's interesting? And today they can go, they, they go backwards and they track earthquakes. They can go back, they can go back to the year 33 AD. There was an earthquake in Jerusalem in 33 AD. <laughs> the earthquakes and the temple rips. I, Guys, I, I wanna, I'm looking forward to seeing this on an IMAX screen. On. <laughs> I, um, we were talking at the ta- our, our table. I, um, the guy who mentored me said, Ron, if, if you really want to walk closer with God every day, you have to daily be on a bench with him. Somewhere on your property, find a bench. Find a place to meet with him. Talk with him. As you get into God's word, talk with him about that. He'll unveil truths to you. And the Holy Spirit dropped on me. I should start reading the Bible. If I lived then, whatever I was reading, if I was alive then, what would I see? What would I feel? What would I taste? What would I smell? And what was going on in heaven from God's point of view when this took place? I, I'm, this is asking the children. You know, my grandson's here. Anything he asked me, likely I'm going to, I don't think I'm just going to spoil him. I'm going to give it to him. Right? <laughs> My son, not so much. No, I actually do. Um, (laughs) (laughs) 
I'm asking God. You guys not, might not be asking this, so we're not this far, we're not far off from being in heaven. And there's a mansion being prepared for us, okay? In my mansion, I'm asking for an IMAX screen. And I want to be able to say, I want to see it. Push a button. Elijah taking on those prophets. I want to see it. Moses parting the Red Sea. I'll invite you over. Let's look. Let's, let's watch it. Right? David killing Goliath. Gideon with 300 men. What happened in this moment? When that earthquake and that temple curtain tore, what was going on in heaven? This was a triumphant moment. Do you know that curtain? Moses' curtain wasn't as big. The temple, the travel. At this time, that temple curtain was 30 feet wide, 60 feet high, four to six inches thick. It took 300 priests, Josephus, Josephus, excuse me, says this. It took 300 priests to lift it and put it up. When they cleaned it, to take it down. When they decided to destroy it, to tear it apart, they would put horses on it. They couldn't do it. That's what this this curtain was. And Matthew makes a point to say it was ripped from the bottom, from the top to the bottom. Why do you say that? Because the arguments had already started. The earthquake caused that. It wasn't God's hand. It was the earthquake. It tore from the top to the bottom, not the bottom up. So what's the significance of this curtain being torn? Why was it so triumphant? Why, why is it even mentioned? What was so important that the curtain was torn? <laughs> Turn the page. <laughs> Let's look inside. I have a picture there of what, oh, say, in Exodus 25, verse 8. Number one, Moses is on Mount Sinai, and God gives him a vision of the temple he wants him to build to take through the desert with him. And the reason he says, I want to have a temple is I want to dwell with the people. And I want the people to know that I'm there. And so we're going to build a temple that looks like this. All right, you have a picture of it there. The outside, it's, the size of it's not that big. It's 75 feet by 150 feet. This room is probably 50 by 100, so it's about a third, a little bigger than this. Okay? There's six pieces of furniture in here. It's amazing, God's plan that he devised before, before, before the foundation of the world. He knew he's going to put man in the backyard of Satan on this planet where he had thrown Satan. He's going to put us right in the backyard, and we're going to fall, and he has to have a plan. He's a holy God, and it has to be accounted for, and it needs to have a blood sacrifice. And so he gives this as a picture a foregoing of what's gonna be coming that we're celebrating today. So there's six pieces of furniture. At the, they're laid out in, a, in the shape of a cross. Before, underneath there, we'll go through them really quickly, but there's a gate, the east gate. Okay, to enter in to the presence of God, you have to go through gate. There's only one, only one way in. There's only one way, it's the east gate. What does Jesus say? Look at that. John 10, verse 9. I'm the gate. Whoever enters in through me will be saved. All right? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father if not by me. Guys, we can't do it by being good, by trying to serve, by giving more money. That just comes out of a flow because of what he did. We're not going to get in the gate from doing that. Buddha won't get you in. Mohammed's not going to get you in. Rama and Krishna is not going to get you in. New Age isn't going to get you in. Jesus said, this is the picture. I'm the gate. Whoever enters in through me can be saved. So now once we're inside, what's in there? 
Well, there was an altar, a bronze altar of sacrifice. And as a foregoing, if you were an Israelite, and if you sinned, you'd bring a lamb or a goat. There were other things you could bring if you didn't have enough money for a lamb or a goat, but primarily it was a lamb or a goat. And you would bring that, you'd come to the gate, you'd come in with your lamb or your goat, you'd go up to the priest, you put your hand on your lamb or your goat to identify your sin with that animal. And then you cut its throat. And the priest puts it on the altar and sacrifices it. What did John say when he saw Jesus? The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. The first piece of furniture is a picture of Jesus. Every one of these are. And guys, lest we think that the Jewish leaders did that and put Jesus on the cross or the Roman soldiers did that. Know this, look, look what Jesus said in John 10 verse 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay down my life on my own accord, because this was God's plan that I give my life. <laughs> if you go to the garden the night before, Jesus is praying, he wakes up, his closest guys are sleeping, couldn't you, <laughs> couldn't you stay awake with me for an hour? <laughs> He's sweating blood. Here comes Judas, Roman soldiers, torches blazing, lanterns, armed. Jesus looks at him and says, who, who are you looking for? And he said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I'm he. You know what happened? They fell backwards and fell down. <laughs> they couldn't help themselves. They had no chance. They got back up and Jesus said, who are you looking for? <laughs> he said, Jesus, I said, I told you I'm he. Let these, let these guys go. You want me. Peter. <laughs> Off with the ear. And Jesus says, Peter, shouldn't I drink this cup of suffering which the Father has for me? I'm fulfilling the plan before the foundation of the world, the plan that's been laid out throughout the entire Old Testament. I'm the sacrificial lamb. What happens after you sacrifice? Only the priests can move forward from that point. So the priest has to go to labor and wash his hands. Why? Because it says if he walks inside the holy place with blood on his hands, he dies. You can't bring that in to the holy place. Look at what it says in Exodus 22. Ananias is sent to meet Paul. Not a job anybody would have wanted back then. Because <laughs> Paul was killing Christians, right? And I said, you go meet with Paul. <laughs> okay, so he goes, he says, Paul, God has called you to be his servant, to tell his story. He says, now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, calling on his name. We're told we are priests. <laughs> Guys, we don't have time to go all through all this. We'll give it to you. You're going to go home with it. Take a look at it. These are things we should teach our wives. Amen. These are things we should teach our kids, yeah. our grandkids. Let them know the picture that God has. Every piece was fulfilled by Jesus. You walk into the holy place. Complete darkness except for what? The lamp. Jesus is the light of the world. And he says, I have to leave. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. Who's your light? And then because of that, you're the light. Right? The showbread. You only had to keep it fresh. What does it represent? God wanted communion. He wants fellowship. He wants to sit with him, talk with him like we're at a table. Priest, keep that fresh bread. Right, Bill? We can't have steel. 
It's got to be fresh bread. When you talk to people, are you, are you fresh in the bread that you're sharing with them? Are you in his word? Are you letting it just infiltrate your life? That's where he wants us to be, guys. That's what's important. Then it's not two worlds, it's one world. You're the same guy no matter where you are because of this. You go forward to the altar of incense. Again, only, you're right to the curtain now. The altar, what is the altar of incense? Priest, morning, night, go pray. The incense that lifts is a picture of our prayers lifted up. We're told pray without ceasing. And we're told we are priests. <laughs> He's now many as priests. So now you're standing before the curtain. What's on the other side of the curtain? Glory. The Ark of the Covenant. Glory. When Jesus says, I'm the way, I sacrificed for you. Therefore, that's the way to get to God. I'm the truth. What is that? I'm light. I'm fellowship. You pray. You have access to the Father. <laughs> I'm the way. I'm the truth. The light. What's inside? The light. God's kind of glory. Look on the back page. The Ark of the Covenant. Here's what God said about it. Again, in Exodus 25, verse 8, I want to dwell with you. And I will meet with you above the mercy seat. Between the two cherubim that are the, over the Ark of the Covenant... I will speak with you about all that I command you regarding the Israelites. So here this Ark of the Covenant was. Once a year, only the high priest could go into the most holy place. He would walk in. I put a picture of it there. He would have blood from the sacrifice. He would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. The mercy seat is where God dwelled. His light shone from that. But nobody had access. Why? Well, wait a minute. They sacrificed. Why didn't they have access? The sacrifice was only a symbol. Animal blood is not good enough for a sacrifice. God tells us that. It had to be his son. It had to be someone who was perfect, who lived a perfect, who was holy, who did, who did not sin. Sacrifice. That's what God did for us. It's such an amazing picture through the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled. Hebrews explains it in Hebrews 9 and 10. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again. When Jesus said to tell us die, paid in full, all these sacrifices ended. It no longer needed to be, it was no longer needed. What kind of celebration was in heaven when Jesus walked in and said, paid in full, it's done. There doesn't have to be sacrificed year after year after year anymore. It's done. This artist that came up with this picture, take a look at that picture on the bottom. I read what the artist did this by accident. She started painting and she decided to come up with a picture from the inside the most holy looking out when the curtain split. And there we are standing, now having access into the holy place. And when she said, stood back and looked at how I drew it, I'm standing right on the mercy seat, right where God wants us to meet with him. Not once a year, any day, every day, any time, we have access to the Father because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. <laughs> Somebody told me this story a while back, and it helped me connect the dot in my own life. And it's not Billy and Hazel, but it's Billy and Sally. <laughs> They're brother and sister, they go to their grandparents' house. Grandpa buys a slingshot for Billy, and Sally always hangs out with, with Mimi, right? <laughs> So Billy takes a slingshot, he goes out in the field, and he's practicing the first afternoon. He can't hit anything. He has a can, he can't hit it. So they call for dinner. He's walking back to the house, and there's a pond, and they have a pet duck. Well, Billy takes, I'm going to just try one more shot. And wouldn't you know, <laughs> he hits the duck, <laughs> square in the head, the duck dies. He's like, oh, that's Grandpa's favorite duck. 
So he hides the duck, puts a weight on it, puts it back in the bottom of the pond. Right? He looks up at the window, and there's his sister Sally looking out at him. So he comes in the house, and they're having dinner. Sally didn't say anything. And Grandma says, okay, well, Sally, you help me with the dishes, and, you know, Grandpa and Billy are going to go out for a ride on the forerunner. Sally says, you know, Billy said he wants to help with the dishes, and I'm going to go on the forerunner. So Billy looks at Sally, and she goes, remember the duck. <laughs> so the next morning, you, know, you can get the picture. This goes on for three days. Sally keeps saying, remember the duck. Finally, Billy can't stand anymore. He just at breakfast the fourth morning says, the duck you've been asking for, where's the duck? I killed the duck. I killed the duck. I buried the duck. I'm sorry that I did it. I killed your duck. Grandpa says, I know. I was looking out the other window. <laughs> I was wondering how long you were going to let Sally torture you. <laughs> Guys, we have an enemy. Let me help you with something. You killed the duck. Okay? God knows you killed the duck. He saw you kill the duck. <laughs> but he did that to cover whatever duck it is that you killed. Do not live life allowing Satan to put you in a spot to say, you are disqualified. You cannot serve. You cannot be a reflection of God because you killed a duck. He knows it. He forgave it. He gave his son for it. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To Many men live defeated lives. Let's not be that, guys. When you shine for Jesus, people want to know, what is it about you? What is it that's different? It's in one word, to tell us die. Everything I did has been paid for. Everything I've been, I have eternal life. And not only that, I have a mansion with a big screen. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what God's done for us, right? All hail King Jesus on this Good Friday.